Welcome back to the Conflab, everyone. In this episode, we're talking with Dane Weston. We've had Dane on before, and he is now the founder of Men of Gold. Let's just get into it. There you go. <laughs> oh, well, well, mate, it's um, great to have you back in Studio Lots Has Changed since you were last here, and that's like over six months now. And we've we've kept the, the pedal on the metal here at uh, the Conflab. And really just um, been inspired by probably some of the ripple effects that have come out of things that have been said in here and then watching your growth as well and really inspired and really proud of what you've started and where it can go and the men that it'll affect, which I have this really, really firm belief and I don't at all mean to sound sexist or in any way that when men are thriving, the women and children are thriving. It's, it has this massive ripple effect. And I, I don't mean to put anybody out or any gender out, but I know when men are doing it right, when men are doing and showing up as themselves and working hard, it doesn't mean that they're, they're not going to fail. It just means that they're honest with who they are. They keep their word to themselves. Then the women and children thrive. They, mm-hmm. they really do, you know, kids do. So where <clears throat> the reverse doesn't seem to have the same effect. And I'm, and you can take that back to caveman days where if a child's thriving, that doesn't mean it's going to have the effect on the father or the effect the, or if the mother's doing well, it doesn't seem to have the effect on the father. But it's obvious for me that when men are, the, the whole community is, the whole community is starting to – to pick up and, you know, I love that little quote that the high tide lifts all boats, you know. So like when I when a high tide comes under men, then it raises all the boats in the community and so proud of what you've achieved and, yeah, so welcome back, Dane Weston. Thanks, and, mate. And now you can all see what I was talking <laughs> about. Now, if you, haven't, if you haven't listened to the first episode with Dane, that was our episode two, I believe, or episode four or whatever it was, um, pause now and go back and even if you put it on, you know, one and a half times speed, um, that'll probably be me, me speaking way too fast but Dane speaking probably normally. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just do a recap on Dane's first episode uh, before we get into this. So uh, just a little quick backstory. Dane's an ex-NRL player and grew up under the pressure of, of having mental illness and not really looking after himself, not given the guidance to look after himself, and uh, and that all culminated in in one night where he attempted to take his life, and that there was a big shift there. And mm. so that's just a quick snapshot. But now Dane has decided from that traumatic event to do something that's going to really affect the world, and not just do another tagline or another hashtag or a, or another T-shirt company, and I'm not bagging anyone here, <laughs> but he's actually actively doing something to save men's lives, and that is the men of gold. So welcome, Dane. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Um, excited to, to join you today and um, had fun last time. Seems like yesterday, but six months. It's uh, Yeah, lots happened, mate, um, for me personally, and um, grateful for it all. Um, but... The Men of Gold, it's, you know, something that's been on my heart for a while. Um, not sure if I shared it last time, but it all started by one morning in the in the bathroom shaving my head. Um, and I just <laughs> had this... Shaving the head. I just had this, like, sense, and I, f- I felt like it was God, you know, um, prompting me to, you know, to start this men's group. And So can I just ask, um, just for the sake of relativity for everyone, what is God for you? Um, he's my guidance, mate. Um, and... I just feel like everyone's like, oh, I just, I just feel like my inner voice talking to me. And for those with a faith, that's God speaking, you know. And and for me, that was that morning. Um, I'd had these ideas, and and it's almost like you want things perfect before you start something. And that morning, of all places, um, shaving the head. Yeah. And when I thought about it, I was like, I want to do it right, and I don't want to just be like you said, another tagline or or another. You know, I don't know what you want to call it, but I wanted it to be unique um, and I wanted it to be needed, you know, and this is what is needed in our community. Um, men don't share. Men, you know, overall, there's some that do and they're confident to do it and 
Um, but you know, as a whole, as in our community, we struggle with it. So I wanted to create a safe space where men felt, you know, welcome to come, um, be themselves, you know, not try and put on this act that they have to be a certain way. They can just come and be them and be around like-minded men who need this just as much as they do. So, um, yeah, I, I thought it was important that I take time to think about how it's going to work. I um, I spoke with Locke, our pastor at the church, who uh, blessed us with the opportunity to, to run the night um, out of the cafe, um, which was huge. So it was one less thing we had to think about. Um, he said, you need a team. You can't do this all by yourself. Yeah. As, as much as I like to try and do everything by myself, <laughs> Um, he was right and, and I got my team and I, I sent the offer to a lot of people and a lot of people knocked me back and, and that's that's okay and that's what I wanted. I wanted them to be all in yeah. and the guys I've got are all in Yeah. Um, and each have got their strengths that bring such gold to what we're doing. Um, so we'd, we'd formed a team and we needed a name um, and the name again comes – from a few moments through church um, where my wife initially seen um, a vision from God putting me back together like this kintsugi art. So kintsugi is broken pottery um, and the Japanese have this theory that um, broken things can became, become beautiful yeah. and can be made beautiful. So yeah. with our scars and imperfections that we actually – that's the gold and – the Japanese actually form the pottery together with this gold, yeah. you know, and it looks beautiful. Yeah. And when she told me that and I thought of the gold and I had another word from Locke um, about me being talking to thousands of people in stadiums and, and I was covered in gold, um, it had to be something to do with gold. I was like, if I'm listening to God's voice, these are signs that are coming towards where it needs to be and that's – where we landed as yeah. like men of gold because that's what we want. We want to bring the imperfections, the brokenness out of men and yeah. make it beautiful. Yeah, so uh, what's the art again? Ikazuki? Ikazuki art. Kintsugi art. Kintsugi yeah. art. It's actually the the practice of mending vessels um, and pottery and they put it all back together and when they've completed it, um, it's shown when it's put under pressure to have more strength than it originally did mm before it was formed. So men of gold, if you take that literally, that the broken men that you're dealing with or men that come along and actually share their truth, mm. um, obviously you're not trying to change their truth, but just the ability to share their truth is helping them become more stronger mm. than they were originally before they were a broken vessel. Brilliant. Mm. Love it, mate. And I think too, mate, it's about – been okay with your, our stories. Like yeah. I've been vulnerable and shared the depths of mine yeah. and, and I do all the time um, and being proud of that. It's like don't try and hide behind it, yeah. you know, and I think we've seen such great growth in men from, you know, such an early start to this um, men of gold and um, just seeing them over weeks get comfortable and then sharing. Yeah. I think it's important that we create that space where they do feel safe. You know. I think it's very important for the faith community, um, you know, from my perspective. And we just uh, – we talked with Larissa DeMichael two weeks ago and that that conversation about having holistic health within a faith community and what's been missing there for so long, um, I think it's an extremely important inside a faith community where you can go to a, fa a, a church or a denomination or any sort of religion and spiritualise it but without the holistic um, patterns or building healthy life patterns within doing what you're doing and adding this layer, um, there's been a lot of people in the faith community who have tapped out, who have either lost their faith or tapped out of life completely because they can't, it, they've just left it up to the spiritual side of things rather than going after all the other things that actually are scriptural, body, mind, mm. soul, spirit, you know, that that we, we just can, in the faith community, can look after our spirit but what about our body, you know, and that's that's still worship, you know, and what about our mind, how are we looking after our mind, and those things are, are completely sometimes forgotten. We know mm. in the new age I believe the faith community is catching up to that, what's ha been happening in the world with the looking after the mind through through different act actives, like activities, sorry, like breath work and 
uh, meditation and mindfulness. And, and Larissa was brilliant on that. So, mate, props to you for that. You know, that's, that's a brilliant thing. I did want to ask you, is what you're doing just for the faith community? It's not, mate. And I made that really clear from the get-go. Um, be completely honest, when I met with Locke, our pastor, um, he, w- he wanted it to come from a faith point of view. Um, and I challenged him on it. And I, and I just said, just like the church, we welcome everyone. Um, and I've felt like that's an opportunity for people to make for themselves. We're not here to try and encourage them to do that. If they want to do that on the side or they want to ask questions because they know that we have a faith, then they're more than welcome. But I want to make sure that this is inclusive to all and to go that this is we, – we do have a faith and, yes, we're Christian and we have our beliefs, but we are not pushing that on you. So how do you how do you outwork that in, in the – Day to day of men of gold. How does that? How does that then look? Well, it's just it's just accepting of everyone. Um, we don't we don't start a night out in prayer. We don't start a night out by anything out of the Bible. It's a lot of it's basic stuff. But um, I think it's just about being vulnerable. People know who we are, and it yeah. was important that we share our story with the group. Yeah. And that's what we did from night one. And yeah. it was like I got vulnerable. I shared my story, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so did the other guys, um, and from straight away, people in the crowd and in our men's groups are going, "Wow, you know, we can be vulnerable now because they've set the standard. They've actually shown, put everything out on the table, you know, about them and their lives. And some things are uncomfortable. Yeah. And men would be sitting there going, "Wow, like, yeah. so we can't lead this thing if we can't do it. We can't model vulnerability. How are we going to empower it to others?" Yeah, that's. That's really true, mate, isn't it? You've mm. got to walk the walk with this stuff. You really do have to walk the walk um, before you can talk the talk. And 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 now I believe that that being the example of, like, I've never had a problem with being vulnerable with my stuff. I I, I don't, and I and I so I empathise, probably more sympathise with people who can't do it. Like I I don't really have a problem with showing my shit, you know, like mm. I, I've, I've grown up under the pressure of masks being put on to perform in front of many, many people. So I actually quite rebel against that and go, well, I, I don't really fuck what people think. Mm. You know, in, you know I, ha- I have. I've, I've actually had an addiction to approval, but when it comes to my vulnerability, I've had no problem going, well, this is what's wrong with me and I don't really care what you think, mm. you know. Um, so I do sympathise with people who struggle with that, but that's also probably – help me um, get under people's skin with vulnerability. Mm. And so what has been the thing for you with with, um, with the catalyst of being – like you are an advocate for being vulnerable mm. and people will look at you and go, he's this big, strong, powerful man. And it and it's not just because of the size of your arms. And, and, and I'm, I'm not making fun of that either because you've done a lot of work on yourself to make sure that you're big and strong and that mm. was your football career but you've yeah. carried that on and health is – Huge to you, but it's not just the size of your arms; it's the size of your presence. Mm. Like, you know, you don't intimidate me because I love you and you love me, and we have this relationship. But mm. I can just imagine you walk in the room and you drop the rock eye, and people will go, "Oh shit!" <laughs> you know, like so. You have this intimidating presence, and yet as soon as you speak, you are a vulnerable piece of work, and immediately. So, what's been the catalyst? And like we will get down to unpacking and powering vulnerability and and why it's so important. But I want to understand because you're leading this thing. Um, what was the catalyst to make you so vulnerable? I think in my past, obviously, and I seen firsthand that when I was never in an atmosphere where I felt I could be vulnerable and I could never actually open up and share with someone. Um, that lived experience and seeing firsthand that we go year after year after year with you know, the same messages, the same awareness about mental health. And it, yeah. it just, it's on repeat. You know, we have yeah. Are You OK Day for yeah. one day. One day. <laughs> Out of 365, we choose one day to make an importance. Yeah. And sorry, but, I, you know, it's, no, it's no. a great day, but I just call bullshit on it. I yeah. just think, you know, at the end mm-hmm. of the day, why are we as a, a country sitting back and making a focus one day? Yeah. Um, and it just kind of rubs me in the wrong way because I'm just like, it's such a reactive space you know with mental health it's like we wait until something's happened and then it's like oh we better do something what are we going to do to clean this up yeah um and I, I just felt like this is a great a great way for for men to actually learn vulnerability because 
if they haven't had it modelled to them, and I never did as a young age, so I'm I'm prime example. Yeah. That if they've never seen it, they don't know what it is. Yeah. So if if they actually haven't seen it firsthand, it's not their fault that they're not vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You know. So for some people that do come to our groups, mate, they actually haven't. They don't understand it as such, and I know it might seem strange to some, but um, they they sit and they listen to other people share story and just get so much power off it. Mate, we've got 65-year-old men that come. Wow. And 20-year-old men that come. The the old guys get so much power seeing young men get vulnerable. Yeah. You know, we have a lot at the end of the group just applaud these young men, just going, I never would have thought I'd see young men do what you're doing. And that's the fruit of it, mate. And that's why I do what I do. And if we – we have this, you know, saying at Men of Gold that if – one person comes through the door or a hundred come through the door, the night is on. Yeah. Because if that one person's here, they need to be here. Mm. We're, this is not a popularity contest um, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of people out there that do it for that. They're in it for the wrong reasons. Um, we make no financial gain from this. This is literally us giving up our time away from our family to better other men in our community because like you said earlier, mate, the more we can build – strength in men to get vulnerable to lead our families that it's okay to do all that stuff that the stigma is around it's not what men do then everything else is going to work so much better yeah so the the actual uh culture for a 65 year old man so 60 so 60 year old man to 65 to 75 to 85 i guess that was back in the 50s and the 60s when they were young and impressionable 50s 50s, 60s and 70s. So World War War finished in um, in the 40s and then there was, I guess, a stigma of the, the – the, there was a lot of broken men coming out of World War mm. and there was a lot of PTSD and not spoken about. And then we talk about the Vietnam War as well and that was huge even coming out of the Vietnam War. So we're talking about the effects of mental health in the wars and I never really dealt with but – it was the tough man. It was like you don't speak about that stuff. You don't talk about that stuff. You don't echo vulnerability. You're the caveman. You go out, you catch the food, kill the food, bring it home, you know, and the the women cook it up and, and, and it should never it, – it is like that because that's what naturally we, mm. we, are, we are like. However, it shouldn't be like that because there's a lot of men – that aren't designed that way, yeah. and they're not—they're not designed to go out and catch, kill the food. Some women are, yeah. you know, and I'm pretty scared of some of those women. But, <laughs> but you know, like so, it, it comes back down to design with that, and so, so, so some men can be vulnerable and still go out and catch, kill food. Mm. But if that's the example, then we're putting a plug in the men that aren't designed to look as tough as those men, mm. and so therefore, and like I want to go back to your story. When you were 24, you were you had a really good life. You were playing A grade football at Penrith, that you were diagnosed with depression and anxiety. And you know, depression is the suppression of feelings and emotions. So that's the suppression of them. That's what depression is. Like when you can't share your emotions. So here we are talking about vulnerability. So there was a, a vulnerable Dane inside who wanted to get out, but your example of life was to depress those emotions and feelings, forming a habit of depression. And then anxiety was worry about the future, what's going to happen, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about this and it builds this and there's all sorts of science and biology and psychology around all that stuff that I don't understand. People way smarter than me can explain it but it also does stuff to your, you know, your makeup and so on inside and anxiety will form stress and stress and then stress can form disease in your body and I say it probably on quite a few podcasts, Peter Crone says, Disease in the mind causes disease in the body. Mm. And so I believe in that. But at 24, you were diagnosed with those two things. And then you didn't tell anybody until like way later in life. Mm. And so that vulnerable person inside you wanted to come out. And so it's for me, it's, it's knowing you as well as I do, it's no surprise to me to see you set something up in this format that's all about vulnerability because – your, your vulnerability was stifled. I mean, there would have been a – I'm assuming, so I want you to actually go there for us. I'm assuming this, that there was a young six-year-old Dane inside a 24-year-old body screaming to get out mm. and tell the world how he actually felt. Mm. Yeah, it's so true, mate. Like, um, you know, they're always there. Um, but again, I, I go back to my childhood and 
I never seen it or I never knew how to do it. No. And it's like anything. If you don't know how to do something and you're not taught or you, you don't see something, well, how you just don't make it up. Um, and it's such a deep thing for me and um, took a long time. But um, it's funny and not getting off topic with it, but during that time, even from 24, I've always said this and you spoke about my presence before um, and, I, and I'm not flexing here or anything like that, but at the, the end of the day I've always – found myself when I do enter a room or I'm somewhere that I feel like people sit back and listen. Um, and again, for some, it might be just cause you know, the way I'm put together. Um, but I believe there's something that I've been gifted with is when I do speak, people want to hang on every word I'm saying. And, um, I feel uncomfortable saying that, but it's just, I just, that's how I feel. And it's not me trying to put myself on a pedestal, but during that time, even when I was struggling mentally, I had people reach out to me for help, yeah. you know, to come to me and confide in me. And I've always said this before, I've always felt like people feel comfortable coming to me and sharing their, their worries. So during that time, I was dying inside, but I was still ha- like happy to help someone else. Yeah. I just couldn't do it myself. And, yeah. and, and I, we've spoke about this before as well. You see a lot of people who do have mental health issues and you know go to them lengths I did of trying to take my own life we start helping other people because we want to make sure they're okay but we can't do it for ourselves it's just so backward but that's reality it's so um so it's yeah mate like I said it's always been in there and it's just great that um it's out now and it's been out for a while but to to be able to again share lived experience and actually see look back and Again, would never change a thing in my life, mate. And um, it, it's easy to say, oh, but if you're 24, if you just fix things, would your life be different? Of course it would. Um, but I wouldn't change it, you know, because I'm probably not sitting here now doing Men of Gold. I'm probably not sitting here with you talking about this because it's probably gone and I'm probably doing something else. So yeah, Different paths, um, yeah. I never regret anything. I've always said that as well and everything happens for a reason and um, I just hope that this is the start of something new. And, and mate, I... I'm, I am dreaming big with it. Like it's not something that I just want to – a lot of people when I started it and you'll have your people say, oh, yeah, we've tried this and we did a course for six weeks with about men and we did put these in place and it went all right but we didn't get much of a buy-in. And, mate, we, we've had nights where we've had 73 men. That's our biggest night we've had. Wow. Um, anywhere down to four. Well, wow. You know, so – and then anything in between. And the four that needed it. Exactly right. So um, it's still a su- success. If yeah. one person comes every week, it's working yeah. because we can't base mental health and fixing men. We do it one man at a time. That's right. You know, so in that 70, you might argue that, well, maybe some of them didn't get a voice and it's actually too big. Mm-hmm. You know, people could argue what they want. But I want this to become something that's just as common as anything else. So I, I plan to put men of gold in – other areas of Australia. You know, yeah, I was but- gonna, I was gonna, we were, I was gonna ask you what the what the future plans are for Men of Gold, but I want to ask this question first. Um, the The question is like, I want you to explain empowering vulnerability. Like, I, we 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 can understand, like, if we assume, but there's showing vulnerability and empowering vulnerability are two completely different things. Mm. Um, but then I want to ask, what's made you an expert? And I'm not talking about just your lived experiences because you do have a lot of efficacy in this area mm. for people to know. And um, so before we go with where where we see or where you see men of gold going and and I hope that I'm always – well, I know I'm not hopeful at all with this. I actually will, will say this uh, to all of our listeners and to anyone who listens to this in the future. I will always support men of gold and always prop you guys up and promote you as much as I – possibly can because I 100% believe in what you are doing. I don't believe in – like I call bullshit on the Are You Okay Day as well and and I love all their efforts mm. but they're, all their efforts aren't a design mission for themselves. It's not their mission. It's not – they just they just feel bad because stuff's happening but the statistics aren't changing. Mm. So you are actually doing something about the statistics. So firstly explain what is empowering vulnerability. What does that actually mean? Like when you – um, yeah, I'm not going to paint the picture there, but I'm thinking more outside the meeting. Mm. What does that mean? Well, to empower someone to do something, you want to give them the tools and the ability to do it themselves. Mm. The um, word empower. Yeah. yeah. So 
essentially what we want them to see from what we're doing is actually the fruit away from them groups. So when they're home with their wives, girlfriends, you know, friends, whoever, family, that when they're vulnerable, they can see the impact it has on everyone else. It's not just about us. Um, I know from my own experience and still to this day, mate, I talk about last night. I was a miserable bastard last night because of one small thing that I couldn't let go. Um, and that, that affects everyone else in the house. Um, and, and I've said this before, I'm no finished product, mate. I need this just as much as everyone else does. But it's actually seeing the benefits of actually being vulnerable outside the group because we can, we can come to a safe environment and share and be like, oh, this is all right with other men. But then you've got to go and model it or test it with your wife, your girlfriend or your friend, your colleague. That's the test yeah. because we, when we get comfortable, we get comfortable and we're like, oh, this is all right, we can relax. I'll come next week and I'll do the same. Yeah. It's the same audience. And you're relying on the same meeting to yeah. be the outlet of vulnerability, right? Yeah. Right, right. So essentially, mate, the empowering vulnerability slogan that we live by is – to let's do it outside this group, yeah. you know, and let's make that a part of your life, yeah. you know, and so that's that's the gist of and it. What are the tools that, that you guys use to to give to the guys to empower their vulnerability? <sighs> Mate, I can't just put my finger on a few things. It's literally just we, we break down different nights. They're not all the same, you know. They could be one night could be, you know, a, an exercise we do and just, you know, and – we have like a small thing we do at the start where it's highs and lows and it's a bit of a staple of our meetings. And when we introduced it, it went the whole session, <laughs> an hour and 45 I'm not minutes. Surprised. <laughs> um, I'm not surprised. We, we have team meetings here in, in our office and uh, we're supposed to talk about all business stuff and everything like that, but our, our, our how you're doing is it, it lasts for – no, more, nearly most of the meeting and then we do a quick wrap up at the yeah. end. So I'm not surprised. So we realised early on that we actually don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We yeah. don't have to come up with these amazing tools to, to help men. We just need to get them to talk. And that's why when they come in the doors and and I've mentioned on um, on Instagram as well about everyone's got this perception of our men's groups, it's all doom and gloom. It's like everyone comes in with their head down and, you know, in a like dark kind of space. But they actually come in and they meet new people and that connection, which is a massive part of what we do, and we can chat on that. But um, when they, they come in, they're talking. Sometimes I have to tell them to shut up so we can actually <laughs> get on with it. So effectively, even when we're not trying to get them to talk, it's working. Yeah. So sometimes the tools and all that, which are good for different things, but I feel like the basic thing we need them to do is just to open up. Yeah. So the highs and lows is great because instead of asking you direct, Nath, what's going on? What's wrong with you? And if you've never felt comfortable sharing, you're going to sit back and go, oh, this is confronting. I, I, I'm not going to tell you. Mm. You know, so you, you'll probably push back and you'll probably be like, I'm not going to, or you'll go, I'm not coming to this again. Mm. So you've lost them straight away. Wow. So I feel like when you actually just make it generic, it's like high and low. A high could be, you know, a one footy at the weekend. You yeah. know, a low could be we lost footy. It's yeah. as simple as that, you yeah. know, like and it just starts a trait each time we come where they they know what's coming, you know, and then they have something in their mind they want to talk about. And often someone else is then – going through that or had a similar high or a low and then they can relate and then it's, again, it just keeps going. So um, that's that's the only thing we want them to do. But the biggest thing for us too, and to get back to men and the connection part of it, yes, it's around men getting vulnerable, but there's a lot of lonely men out there, mate. Um, I watched a movie a couple of days ago called Otto and – um, yeah, it, what a great movie that, oh, that was. It rocked me, mate, yeah, and yeah. my wife was joking about it, but I was in tears. Yeah. And to be really honest, and I was vulnerable with, you know, the other leaders of Meta Gold, I was like, I think I got upset because I seen what my life would look like if I continually be a miserable bastard at times yeah. um, and just pent up with anger at times and can't let things go. Um, I think I got upset. Well, I know I did. I got upset because I was like, that's going to be my life if I don't turn things around, yeah. if I don't, you know, sort my own shit out. And, you know, and as good as it is what I'm doing, mate, there's times where I'm like, mate, and Lydia will remind me, my wife will say, 
you spend Monday nights empowering vulnerability, but you can't do it yourself. And that's just that's just raw, mate. It's honest. And yeah. we, we we can't be perfect all the time, but it's important I share that because um, it's it's real. Like yeah, only a wise fantastic at <laughs> reminding us where we miss the market. <laughs> But, mate, going back to no, no, the, I love the, <laughs> going back to connection, that's why I find yeah. men as well and we find a lot of older men um, come to our nights, they're not sharing – some of them aren't sharing deep things that are going wrong. They're actually, when they open up, they got, they got great things going on, mm. you know, and we don't hear from a lot of them some deep, dark. And like you said before, we always want the drastic story yeah. to make it – someone go, oh, this is yeah. good to listen Sensationalizing. to. Sensationalising. Yeah. 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 But um, a lot of the, the elderly men are, are saying we love this for connection. and Yeah. Well, it's one of the, you know, like I think Tony Robbins did a list of basic human needs and there were six of them and there's the high, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and a lot of people put that, a lot of philosophy around these things. I think Tony Robbins one's really good but one of his is, is human connection and love and um, my understanding of I think it, this come back from Viktor Frankl or Carl Jung, actually, I think it was, is the basis of basic of basis basic of basic most basic human needs is connection, love, and belonging, and connection and belonging are very similar. So first connect, um, then love, and then you feel belong. And so it sounds to me very much like what you're creating there is a culture of first connection, then love through the way that you're approaching, and then men feel they belong enough to share. Their true vulnerability. So, um, if that's happened organically, well done. Yeah, yeah. Um, we yeah, the empowering and the and the, like. I like what you've done there without having specific tools. And I think that probably in the future, as you grow, you'll end up with some of those things. Um, however, the organic growth that you're experiencing is just um, really inspiring. Mm. To be able to just go, well, you know, take this home to your wife and and be that way and. Like you said, uh, you don't get it right all the time and, and we as men don't mm. and we need to be able to feel that that firstly it's okay, it's not okay to stay there, it's okay. Mm. You know, don't don't have to go through this uh, soulless forgiveness of yourself all the time. you just got to go, look, it's okay. Look at myself in the mirror. I use that uh, naked emotion thing quite a lot where you we, – we, we talk about it where you, you can look at yourself and, and go, right – emotionally naked and go, I'm okay, I'm okay here, this is where I'm at, this is my present state and have a look back at your past and go, hey, I'm nowhere, look where I've come from, mm. this is amazing and then be able to go, I'm okay today mm. and um, and let that let that monkey off your back that you may have missed the mark of it and and keep going because I think that's what, and you will, you will have experienced this, that's what holds people in that space of getting it wrong all the time mm. is when they can't let it go and um, – and, and when they when they keep holding on to that thing and they keep thinking about that and it occupies their mind and what we think about the most is what we become and what we do. Mm. And so being able to go, oh, well, like you said, it's okay. Mm. Come on, mate, let's keep going. Um, what makes you an expert? I mean, I, I, I phrase that really simply, mm. but you have a lot of experience, Dane, in, in this space and what you've done with the QRL and – your work through the NRL, not just playing footy, but understanding. And like you said before, um, you have people come up to you. So that's obviously led down a path of a little bit of education and stuff like that mm. around this space as well. And the the program that you put together for the QRL when you worked for them, which I, I know you don't work for them anymore uh, due to their uh, incessant need for you to be jabbed by something that you should never have been jabbed by mm. – um, and jury's still out on that and I'm sure people will pay a very high price. Yes, I'm getting fucking political and I don't <laughs> care, producer. Um, yeah, so what makes you an expert? I don't like to think of myself as an expert um, but at the same time… Well, I'm going to say you are Yeah. because you don't start something like this. I know this is a passion but without efficacy you can't sustain it. Mm. So I'm going to say you are. Okay. Um my biggest thing and what I've always thought was my point of difference is my lived experience. Um, and I, I may have said this last time as well, um, all respect to people who go study, they, you know, learn you know, about mental health and about wellbeing and all that. And it's, it's needed, we, you know, we're great psychologists, you know, counsellors, and they're all needed, you know, we need that. 
But when I'm talking and in the past when I've spoken to kids, when I've spoken to men, when I've spoken to women as well, I feel like my biggest attribute is me being vulnerable and real and then they can actually connect the story because I've lived it. Mm. So straight away they go, this bloke's not a fake. Mm. This bloke's actually been vulnerable. He didn't have to. He could make up a story about anything. And I'm not saying people do but I think the biggest thing for me is um, – me being vulnerable, being real, having that story because they can relate. And I know myself as a kid, you know, think, think how kids think about things. If they can hear a story and, and relate or visualise something that someone's talking about, they can connect a lot. And I feel like that's my biggest attribute is that, is I'm not making stuff up. I'm, and some things I might say might be how a psychologist says it, but I think that's how it works. Yeah. You know, people get it. You know, I'm dumbing it down if you want and people are just like, I get him because he just says it how it is and it just – that's the way. And I think, um, yeah, I, th- I think that's, you know, the greatest way for me to do it because I'm not going to try and be someone I'm not. No. Um, so I can only be as real as I can and if people want to buy into that, great. If they don't, then I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Um, and, mate, that's why – Again, didn't think we we're going to touch on it, but you know, I did used to work the cure all, and what I sorry, what I put in the <laughs> what I did put into place at that organisation um, had never been done before. And again, I'm not pumping myself up here, but I put my heart and soul into that job. Um, and the saddest thing for me um, to leave and be sacked from a role because I wouldn't get vaccinated was that nobody gave a fuck when I left. Yeah. No one, literally when I was out the door, like I had exemptions, I had, I had everything that technically could have kept me working there if and would have covered all bases of that organisation, their hands would have been clean, so to speak. Um, but at the end of the day, it proved to me that it wasn't about what I could do for them. It was my ability to stand up and challenge their leadership, mm. which at the end of the day showed a lack of leadership because if what I was changing in that space was important to them, they would have bent over backwards to keep me. And that's what hurt me, mate. And that's why I was very outspoken about, and I always am, mate, and it gets me in trouble sometimes, but I don't I don't care for it because the right person will grab it and go, that's what we're about. And that's where I am now. Um, but I've always been outspoken that rugby league has been my connection all my life. And at times I want to get out of it. And I just have always felt... It's a part of me that I can share with ex-footy players, with current, with you know, up and coming. That's my connection. I know it. It's like a tradie. Like they they know their trade. So why not just work at that? Um, but I went into that well-being space because of what things changed in my life, mm. and I just wanted to continue doing that without rugby league being attached to it. Yeah. Um, the inability to be good leaders at an organisation by getting rid of me. Um, I can, I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. You know, I can honestly say, like, thank you because you got me out of an, a toxic environment that is continually still in there and I've got great friends that are still working there and I feel for them. Um, but at the end of the day, I now get to do something and work in the mental health space still. I work for a psychologist and I, I do mental health support one-on-one with men, you yeah. know, and that's the fruit of it, mate. I've now – they've given me an opportunity to get out of what I was – like I was speaking out and saying I, I hated going to work because of all the stuff around it. But the what I was doing in and around it, they were happy to pat me on the back during it. But then when when I didn't agree with something, they're like, well, let's get rid of him. Mm. We don't have people that stand up. And that's leaders, leaders that can't accept criticism and be challenged should be doing something else, playing marbles or something. <laughs> yeah, I can't agree more. Um, I can't agree more. People sit in positions – and they protect protect their position. They've got no idea of growth. Mm. They've got no idea that if they really just stepped aside for a moment and let someone come through, ha- the ability to help the human condition and what we really need to be doing is right there. Mm. And and for me, I am eternally grateful that they didn't like you mm. and they didn't want you in there because I, that's a that's it's just a lifer. Thing, isn't it? Like it's a life of thing. You could have, if they pat you on the back and say, "Yeah, Dane, we're we're for you," and and keep going. We're gonna we're gonna support you. It's a life of situation, mm. you know. And and we've had, you know, uh, Robbo, my coach. He he had the same situation, but he made a choice earlier where he was offered uh, a role as a, a 
a sports and conditioning coach for the, I think it was for the Waratahs or something, and he was coaching the Paralympic team, and he actually was offered this position, which was what where he really wanted to go as a coach and become more of a coach in this area, and then he realised that none of it actually lined up with his values, mm. and then when he talked to his wife or his partner at that point. He realised that even coaching the Paralympic team and he was coach of the year for that year was still not lining up completely with his values. So he just quit both. He, he said no to the opportunity with the Waratahs, I think it was Waratahs, mm. and then said no to the opportunity, no, no to his job then as a coach for the Paralympic team, which he had formed incredible connections mm. and loved these people and, and, and remarkably into what they have done and, and supported them. And he went off on his journey of doing what he's doing now, which is actually similar to what you are doing mm. and um, changing the world one man at a time. Mm. And and so the values thing obviously has a very, very big piece in your decision not to – like we can look at I, – I, I have this thing. We talked with, with Geordie Chenery and he said he made a couple of instant decisions to get out of Melbourne when the lockdowns were on. He just had to make these instant decisions but I – I reminded him that the decision was made maybe instantly but it was made out of your values. Mm. So the more that we work on our values and what they are and we anchor into them, the decision can be quick but it's made very, very wisely because it, it realised that we are out of alignment and we need to come back into alignment. Mm. How much of that happened with the QRL that you are maybe out of alignment and and getting out of there to get back into your full alignment with what you were purposed for and, and like some of your values, like a phenomenal, like your faith is a, a, a huge value, your faith in God, uh, respect. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of respect in what you were just talking about. Mm. Honesty, again, there, there was no honesty there in that situation. And, and I don't, I'm don't. i not bagging out just the QRL. We, we, we know that inside of nearly every organisation on the planet, mm. there's people that operate in authority, over authoritarian uh, positions to keep people away from growth and stuff. So that happens in business and in, in every organisation. So not just the QRL. Uh, empathy, that didn't sound like there was any empathy and loyalty. Mm. And they're, they're four of your top five. Mm. Um, I don't know how much faith was in the, in the thing either. So for me, I look at that and go, you were, you, you were just not going to last because you were going to be out of alignment. How much of that is true? Yeah, all of it, mate. Um, and, I, and I lent on all of that throughout the whole process. This is a process that went on for almost six months. Um, and I told them from the very beginning that there's no way I'm going to get vaccinated. Um, but instead of working with me, and, and I use examples like, you know, in the NRL, very close to home, and I'm working at the QRL, we've got players who decided because of whatever reason they didn't want to get vaccinated – those clubs seen the value, and I'll, and I'll drop one of them, Jason Tomalolo, getting paid a million dollars a year. He's an asset to the, the Cowboys. So they looked at him and said, well, we respect that that's his decision, so we'll do everything we can, so we need Jason in our team. You know, So they went over and beyond. He got exemption after exemption, so he could continue doing it. We realise it's full of crap anyway, and Jason's still doing what he's doing, and good on him. And yeah. there's, there's many more stories like Novak, that. But Novak Dokovic. Yeah, like at the end of the day. So the way I looked at it, mate, I'm not important enough for you guys, you know, yeah. and that's – and I said it, it hurt that anything I'd done before didn't matter. Um, and so, so Jason's values, he stuck by and they supported his values. Yeah. But you're saying – what yeah. happened? And we're talking about, yes, it's the Cowboys, but it's essentially it's the NRL. And yeah. I know them and the QRL are separate identities, but we're working in the same game. Um, and that's where I'm just like, I just couldn't fathom them. And that's where I was first was like, this isn't about the vaccine. And it, it never was, mate. And I can and I honestly say it and I know it. Send it back to insecurity. I've challenged them. That's why I'm not in the job anymore. Yeah. It's because I actually stood up. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to waste time on, you know, and that's why I moved. That's why I was like, I'm making this decision. I'll look after myself and I'll go because, mate, I walked out without a job. For two months I had no work. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to my number one um, and that's my faith. And yeah. for the first time, mate, I literally stood there with no job, three kids at home and a mortgage and I'm, I'm just like – and it all come back. I never felt so content. And with the anxiety that used to riddle me, I was like, something will happen. I got another job on 
like after that eight weeks, when I had a payout from the QRL of leave and whatnot, literally on the Monday started a new job. Yeah, and it just everything along the way has just worked out the way it was meant to, mate. And I'm just so such in a great position that I get to. I've got stability. I get to do something I love. Um, I'm happy. Um, I'm paying. You know, I'm earning more money than I was, and I'm like, there's the gold in it. I'm like, and through my faith and actually just going, God's got me. And at the end of the day. I'm going to live up to my values. I'm going to just do something because you're telling me to and it's it doesn't line up. And that alignment, when it was out, I was like, this is not for me. I'm not wasting time, you know. Yeah. It's a really good point because I, I guess – and, you know, obviously we started the conversation about the, the vaccine and all that sort of stuff and we didn't mean that to go there and that's not be political about it. But I, I think a lot of companies of – organisations have used it as an excuse to get rid of people that they, they have a problem with and – but you could have been a victim and fought them, but you've chosen not to, which I really honour. I really do honour that because the energy that you're putting into to that, uh, rather than the energy you're putting into that, you, mm. what you what the energy you expend trying to fight the rubbish, mm. you've gone and turned around and put the energy into this, which has actually done the opposite. So, um, and I, I think that speaks very loudly of your values. And um, and where you know you've anchored back into them and mm. how important it is, and so there was a couple of things in that. Um, but I just want to echo that, like what Dane said about he's now working in his design and he's feeling abundant. He was not concerned about it. And there's so many, I guess that's another thing for men uh, who uh, do hide this quite a lot is they know they're not designed to do what they're doing. Mm. They know that they might be and. And I think it's Gay Hendricks he talks about in, in The Big Leap, the book The Big Leap, about the four zones that we operate in, the incompetent zone, the competent zone, the uh, e- uh, excellent zone, and then the zone of genius or those those four zones. And most people operate in the competence zone and the excellent zone and, and they, they can both give us our money and support and, and do everything we need to do. But so often we are designed for something way more and – uh, we don't step out and do that and a lot of men are afraid to speak about it and I think it actually brings a lot of anxiety mm. into men because they know they're designed to do something better or greater and in the Australian in our Australian culture it's we have a tall poppy syndrome and, and I've heard you say you're not flexing and all that stuff and don't want to because we are so afraid of the tall poppy syndrome but if you're gifted with something you should be able to speak out about how you feel about yourself about it. Mm. Number one how you feel about yourself about it. And like I'm confident in what I do now and I'm confident in who I am and I it's me first. Mm. You know, I validate myself. And so – and that only comes from being in alignment. So both – I know Dane will echo what I say here. If you feel like you're designed for something else, have the faith to step out and start it. doesn't mean go all the way in, be wise about it like Dane was. He, he got to the very end of what he could do with where he was at and there was no more room anymore – and so that decision was basically made for him and the new thing arrived. But we want to we want to echo, like a lot of men's anxiety and depression and mental health comes because you're not operating out of the person that you were designed to be because that's where fulfilment is. That's where real abundance is. That's where real love, you can operate out of love and compassion, kindness properly. And, and at the end of the day, you'll get what you're supposed to get out of it, whether you're supposed to be a multi-billionaire or whether you're supposed to be another Mother Teresa mm. – whether you're supposed to be the best lawnmower on the Gold Coast or in Australia, whatever it is you were designed for, you'll get the most out of that. And uh, and comparison is a motherfucker, so don't use it, you know, like it really is. But on that too, mate, like a lot of people like, ah, oh, it's good you get to do something you love and, you know, we talk about all that. But it's no accident where I am, you know what I mean? And that's why a lot of people like, oh, you're lucky, da-da, and I'm like, no, I've, I've worked hard to get where I've got. Um, but also... What, what are you passionate about, you know? And they're like, oh, I'd love to do this. But but there's always limitations. They're always straight away. And, mate, I've had these conversations with you where I've always wanted to get out into this space where help people do one-on-one coaching this and you're like, what's stopping you? And I'm like, oh, well, I've got a mortgage. Yeah, and money. I've said it. Yeah, yeah. money, all yeah. these different things. Yeah. And I was forced into the situation, yeah. which I had no choice, but it was the best thing that ever happened, yeah. you know? And other people have the exact same opportunity, but they're more concerned that, they may lose something if they make a choice. So in the long run, it'll be better for them. They don't see that. Yeah. But we talked earlier about um, before on the air about 
uh, instant gratification. People aren't willing to wait yeah. to see the gold in something. If they don't see it straight away or they can't be in that job straight away and have it all done, yeah. then they don't have a crack. So they are miserable. They earn all the money and you see rich people yeah. that are unhappy because they're not literally doing what they want to do. Uh. They like the money but – when, when they stop spending it on things they want, it's like, what else is your life about? Like, yeah. where are your friends? Where's your family? Where's these things that people, like, hold so high in their life? And, you know, whether it's a lawnmower, um, a lawnmower business or whether it is mental health or a coach, whatever it is, they'd, if they're doing that because that's their passion, good on them. Yeah. You know, and good things are happening around that that fulfil them and it's not all about money. Uh. I, I spoke to one of my... Um, Good, good friends the other day who's um, – he's in his 60s and he's been a, a bit of a um, mentor for me from a young age. He's one of my dad's mates and at a pinnacle time in my career early on in my footy, I wanted to give footy away and he was there for me um, to take me to train and train with him. He was a fit bloke and he, and I connected with him. He's a funny guy and I love him dearly and um, he lives up in the sunny coast and from Goulburn and, and – um, he come down, I met with him and he was talking to me. He was getting emotional, like sharing with me. He goes, mate, I live with my with my daughter on their property up on the sunny coast. Me, his wife Donna, and he's like, but I'm so rich in love. I've got family, I've got this. And he's like, he starts welling up and he's like, he goes, money, I don't care for it. I, I don't have anything to show for it. But And he was he was telling me a story and, and um, about this guy who impacted – Keezy, my mate, impacted this guy so much that randomly one day come up to him, come up to him and said, he's married, uh, had family, whatnot, and he said, um, I've just done my will and a third of it's going to you. Wow. And Keezy was blown away. He's like, what? And he just couldn't comprehend it that someone has obviously been so impacted by his love and his guidance and, and almost similar to what he does for me. Yeah. And then he's – that's what it meant to him. And Keezy's like, things will happen for me. Like I don't have money and I don't – but I'm rich in love and people don't have that. Yeah. You know, and it's so true, mate. And on, I honour him, mate, because I see it firsthand when he speaks each time. I'm like, it's so important when we miss it a lot of the time and there's so many out there that never get to experience it. Yeah. We'll never have that feeling, you know. Yeah. What's his full name? Gary Keys, and he lives on the Sunshine Coast. Yeah. So if you're on the Sunshine Coast and you run into Gary Keys, you know what to do. <laughs> Go and pat him on the back, buy him a coffee. <laughs> Honestly, the guy sounds. And and that, it actually leads me to this: is that for you, for men and men of gold, becoming men of gold or becoming an unbeatable person or becoming anything like that, is that sometimes we can't see what we should become. Mm. So we need someone to push us. And I remember the conversations that Dane and I had had where he couldn't maybe see how to, but the only question I had, well, it wasn't even a question, it was, it was like end. He'd say, oh, I, I need to earn the money, I can't do it without the money, I'd go end, you know. Like what if, what if you do? What if it is successful? What if, you know, and uh, like I'm I'm so proud of you, mate, for actually going, I'm not waiting for the money, I'm stepping out of the boat, I'm going for it. And now you are working in the space, you know, what? what's the space you're working in now? What do you do now? Yeah, I work for Erzy Psychology and um, and I work with um, men, um, essentially one-on-one, -on -one, do mental health support with them um, and it's been so good. Again, I, I work with some of my clients are in their early 20s. Um, my eldest is 47 um, and, yeah, it's it's been such a rewarding process. Um, one of my clients is just the bond we've – we've got it's like a little brother right. and right. um you wouldn't feel like it's work mate like i take him to the gym at emf at rubina twice a week we go get coffee um he's just loving hot and cold pools yeah. and and stuff and um i kind of people are like that's what you do for work and i'm like yeah and i'm like this is so good yeah but i see all that's good but i just see from a, this young kid who is riddled with challenges and I say challenges because I hate putting labels on people, you know, oh, he's, he's autistic or he's, yeah. you know, he's this yeah. or he's that. Well, he's just like you or I but he's just got more challenges than we do. Yeah. Um, 
and at times he jokes about it and he goes, you're just very similar to me, I reckon. And, and, um, and mate, he's right. There's sometimes I'm like, there, maybe there's a few more labels for me, but um, <laughs> the more I do this work, there probably is. But um, I relate. And from the get-go, um, I was a fill-in for him and he had other support workers and he does. He's got multiple. He needs a lot of care. And um, after five minutes of this day, I filled in for his other support work. He's like... Um, I'm, I'm getting you. He goes, I don't care, I'm getting you. And I'm like, in five minutes you've decided that? Um, and I was with his mum and, and it was great. And since that day, mate, we just built this bond that, um, you know, I know it's a job but it's so deeper than that and um, it's great to be paid to do something you love but at the same time I can see how much he's getting out of this. You know, I can see a kid that's so dependable on his mum and, and his family that he can actually step out and, and feel – you know, so loved by someone else and being in, in public and go to the gym and getting out and being active and, um, yeah, it's it, in a matter of months, mate, he's made so many, you know, so much progress and that's the part for me where I'm like, that's why I do it, Yeah, you know, and it's, it's so good, you know, the little things and I get back to it. You do something you love, it's not work. It's yeah. just what you're designed and created to do. Yeah, you should be rewarded financially for doing what you are designed to do. Mm. You, you deserve to be. Yeah. That's the opposite of saying I get paid to go and work. Yeah. You know. When you're looking at the clock and you just can't wait to get home, yeah. well, then that's yeah. that's not what you're designed to do. Right. But um, in saying that, there are days where I do want to get home, but <laughs> like anyone. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really um, good for me. Um, I've got another job as well that I do. Um, I work for a cleaning company um, as an account manager um, and, yeah, not something I thought I'd get into but essentially is building relationships um, just with venue managers so I just make sure they're happy with the cleaning service that's happening and um, and I yeah, connect with the venue managers and just relationship building, mate, make sure everything's all good and, and that's the stability that – you know, and then it gives me the opportunity to do this yeah. Yeah, mental health stuff as well. So collectively, mate, I'm, I'm doing what I need to do to, you know, and, and I'm happy and that's that's the main thing. Oh, that's brilliant. The future of Men of Gold, let's let's get a bit of vision from you. Let's let's see where this can go and, mm. and what – I don't let, – let your big dream out rather than the small one, um, unlimited, like because the, I know that there's the, – our audience here – is predominantly, I think, 19 to 44-year-old men and um, you never know who's listening. Mm. You know, someone could be listening that just wants to come alongside you and say let's let's take this to the next level or whatever. Um, so let's let's hear it, mate. What's your big dream? Yeah, the biggest dr- dream for this to, is to get across the whole country um, and, you know, that's – to Brilliant. me it doesn't seem um, – It'll be a process, mate, don't get me wrong, um, but I reckon um, there's big organisations that said the exact same thing one day. Um, so I I have to I, because if I don't have that dream, I'm only focused on one area and, and it's bigger than that. And I just – there's so many people. I've got a mate in Sydney who is really keen to do it in Western Sydney and um, I think without being a control freak, um, which I am um, – I want the right people. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's rephrase control to, to someone who actually cares about excellence. <laughs> yeah, let's say that. Um, no, but I think going back to what Locke said initially to, to me when I started is like you need the right people. The right people. You know, and I, and I think if this is ever going to grow bigger than um, – you know, Tweed Coast and, and looking after, you know, Tweed and the Gold Coast. Yeah, we heard Larissa talk about the Tweed Coast as being the butthole of uh, – the butt crack of the Gold Coast. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, she did say that, by the way. But go um, on. Yeah, so I just think it's – yeah, it can expand um, because if people are hearing about this in Brisbane, it's like with all due respect to what we're doing, they're not going to travel an hour and 15 minutes to Tweed every no. Monday night. Um and that's going to – we're going to change how we do things. It doesn't have to be so, you know, set on every Monday. We're going to look at doing things different because we need to be able to be flexible for other people as well that can't do Mondays. Um, yeah. Do you do virtual? We don't, mate, no. Um, but, but, again, we're, we're meeting soon to come up with what we can add and take away from for this year and, you know, as we push through. And um, so I think 
that given the opportunity to other people and mate don't get me wrong there's probably men's groups out there across Australia that we know and I see some good things on social media of different organisations yeah there's some um, great ones in yeah there. so there's definitely people with the right intentions with their heart in this that they want to do it and um, I just feel that there's going to be people that you know I'm open for people to reach out to go I'd love to do this and set it up under the Men of Gold banner and um, but it all comes back to, like I said, the right people. We, we don't want this just to turn into a popularity contest where it's like, you know, we're getting the shirts and doing this and it's all about us because it's not. We just think that, you know, you walking around in a shirt and someone reading the back of your shirt about empowering vulnerability, it starts a conversation. Yeah. And that's doing our job, you know. And there's so many different little things, but the big, big picture, mate. I want, you know, Gotcha for Life is a is a massive one in Sydney and Gus Wall and you know personality in 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 around the sporting um, scene and and he does a lot of things, great things on the road for men's health and stuff. And he's well known, mate. You know, and um, and for me, looking at someone like that, that inspires me to go. I don't want to be known for Men of Gold because that can look after itself. But to reach the people he does and to get the following he does because of who he is, that's the part I want. Okay. That's the part where I want, well, well, we know Dane Weston, well, we know you know Adam Burns or Jason Jenkins, yeah. them guys, yeah, they do Men of Gold. And then because of how well it's doing and someone else grabs it and it's doing it somewhere else, that's what I want. I, yeah. I want it to be influenced, yeah. you know, so yeah. – um, and just getting the right people, uh, you know, just not so much to run them to, but to be ambassadors for it and to actually push the message because w- rugby league's always been a great voice for stars to actually, you know, share, you know, and that's what kids aspire. I did. When I was six, I was looking at them. Yeah. You know, so if we can throw a men a gold shirt on, you know, some celebrities or some sports stars that actually are genuine in this, they're not just doing it because we're going to say do this as a favour, they actually buy into it, you know, and I think that's important just because you're famous but you don't believe in what we're doing. Well, you might but you're not passionate. Mm. I don't – that doesn't align with me. So yeah. it's – um yeah, I, it'll be a slow slow process, mate, of course, but that's – yeah, that's the goal. So what can you just – um Name that organisation again. Was it Gotcha for Life? Gotcha for Life. And who's the founder of Gotcha for Life? Gus Walland. Gus Walland, wow. Mm. Um, big echo to those guys. There's plenty of great foundations that are doing stuff. But what is what's the what do you need? You like obviously can articulate you know, you've been saying you need um, different things, but what is the one thing now, right now, that you need to get your next men of gold open? Uh, just word of mouth, getting the right people wanting to actually reach out to me, um, yep. having that ability to go, well, I can see your vision. Um, you know, and like my mate in Western Sydney, he's got a, an area down there that um, he can see it and, and I'd love for him to start it and that's probably one that I've already got in the pipeline oh. where I'd love for him to do that. Um, and then there could be people that, you know, go to that or people he, you know, sees what he's doing at that one in Western Sydney that might see – catch the eye of someone else and then they want to actually do something because Sydney's massive. Yeah. So, you know, it's got the ability, The I want the snowball effect for someone to see it, invest in it to go, well, this is what I want to do as well. Yeah. Um, and even organisations, I can see, um, you know, I've, I've been asked to go out to schools um, and, and businesses where I've actually shared this um, yeah. too and, and the mental health piece. So as much as we just do the – um, the, the men's group nights, uh, really open to be actually going to different organisations. I'd love to get out to some of the you know, NRL teams and actually talk about vulnerability and actually present to, to teams, which is that's part of kind of what I've got in the pipeline as well, what I want to do. Um, and again, just not be a voice on a Monday night, but yeah. actually get this at different levels, like get out into community, get out into you know corporates and stuff and talk to it because I just feel like the more we expose it, the more we let other people know what we're doing, mm. that's when, you know, we'll get more people invested. Do you have an idea on distance for chapters? Like you obviously have a chapter in Tweed Heads mm. of the Men of Gold. Do you have an idea of how far apart? Yeah. In, 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 mate, you know, our max. Our like, max, you yeah. know, you, we're all busy, mate. You know, we have a people in Tweed that are busy and can't come. Um, Gold Coast, you know, where I am in Corumbin. And so, um like I said, I'd like to see a couple more on the coast yeah. um, 
and then you know you might have one in Burley and Southport. You yeah, know, and that yeah. covers covers the Gold Coast and, Gold and Coast. Tweed Coast. You know, so um, and then you know you could be talking, you know, Lismore. You could be talking Byron. You know, whatever. Yeah. But you know that you know anywhere from half an hour to forty five to an hour. I think you need something else. You know, yeah. and um, so when you think of that distance in Australia, you know, if we were had the goal to put there, just thousands of them. Thousands you of know? them. You yeah. know, so. Um, yeah. Well, mate, you're a pioneer in this space and, and as much as there's been so many other things started and I guess uh, they can all be a concert to each other. They can all work in concert to each other mm. and you've got your values and your vision for Men of Gold and where it's going, which is phenomenal, really. Um, and, I, you know, like it is you. Like it's, I could have started something like this but it wouldn't be me. Mm. Um, so I really do honour that. And if you're out there listening and you're in – any area in Australia um, and you have this passion for vulnerability and you have this passion for men and, and mental health issues, you know and you, you, you're, you're the one in need, like Dane was, um, reach out to Dane and have a, start a conversation about starting a chapter in your area. I, I can't uh, endorse that enough for, for every area in Australia because we need to do something to move this bloody needle away from where it's going. The needle's still out there. And we're only talking about suicide there, that needle. Uh, I think it's 3,455 or some of that every year. And it's growing. It hasn't come back. It's growing. And that's only talking about people that are actually end their life with it. We're not talking about everyone else who struggles with it, you mm. know. So mental health is a huge topic. And um, I, I think that this is one of the answers for men to be able to feel like they belong to a group where they can feel so comfortable to learn tools and tips mm. to take home to their families. And like we started this whole episode with when the men are doing well, you know, the families and the communities are really starting to thrive properly. Mm. So, yeah, mate, good on you. So uh, in your opinion, what is the most important thing that men need, like to remove the darkness, to wind back the darkness? Now, let's not just talk about men. Because when you were a young boy, it started happening. Mm. But th this also happens for girls uh, and women as well. So what is the most important thing that they – one thing that they need to do to begin to wind back the darkness that starts to take over? Uh, can you land on something there? I think we all just want to belong. Yeah. You know, and I think um, whether we're male, female, um, different ages of our life. 65 down to five. Yeah. yeah, we all just want to belong. We want to be loved for who we are um, and not feel like we can't be ourselves for whatever reason. Like you said, whether it's society that paints that um, about you, that you're a certain way or what, we just want belonging, you know. Yeah. And, and you said it just then. Um, again, that's men feel that you know, when they come because they're like, well, I feel I belong here and I've yeah. got a sense of belonging that I am who I am and people actually love me for it. And um, I think that's pretty natural and I think it's a basic one, but I think that's what everyone's searching for, Yeah, you know, to belong. It's, it's important to have uh, the right communities creating a sense of belonging, isn't it? Mm. I mean, there's so many out there that do, do it well and I remember listening to Dia Khan who is a Muslim woman journalist who did uh, a couple of documentaries, a docuseries, and she's talking to a jihadist. No, she was talking to a white supremacist who ran the Ku Klux Klan basically in the white supremacist movement in America and how they vet people and the way they do it. And we heard it from Elliot Chenery in one of the episodes earlier on is he was vetted into, the, into a bike or criminal organisation, organised crime, and he was vetted in by a way of making him feel like he belonged to because it was rebellion and all that sort of stuff. So um, how important is it for the right communities to be able to have that same, not vet, vetting, mm. but have that same, create that same sense of of you belong here no matter who you are and what you've done, mm. you know. And so, like, yeah, how important is that? Yeah, it's huge, mate. And, again, that's what strengthens the community. Yeah. And you touched on it earlier about men leading that. It's – yeah, and that brings it to in your in society and communities culture. And, and it's actually as well to actually build stronger communities, having good cultures in organisations, whether it's at schools, at work or anywhere where people actually, you know, have that strong community 
which comes back to the way we respect people, the way we are, the way we are daily and come back to daily habits yeah. as well. It's like w these things shouldn't be effort, you know, that's just become people and that's about – you know, making people better people and actually people wanting to be better, whether it's 1% better. But eventually if we've got people with the same mindset that we can see that there's beauty in the fact that we're actually growing resilient men, you know, empowering vulnerability in them so as a whole, we're going to be – everything's going to flow. Yeah. You know, so it's huge. Yeah, so it's really important and what – um what Dane's talking about there is really anchoring out of his values to create that sense of – of proper belonging and and then building routine and, and so on. Which um, brings us to um, the tips that we asked you to bring to build healthy life patterns and understanding that ev even though we've had Dane on here talking about the men of gold um, and what he's doing and, and where this is going uh, today, uh, our series at the moment is about building healthy life patterns and it is so important for the men of gold to be building healthy life patterns so that those healthy life patterns take over. And this is a bit of a rebut to a New Year's resolution. Um, however, we, we I, like I've been building healthy life patterns now for a few years and now I'm starting, you know, they're not an instant gratification thing. They are, are, they are delay gratification because I haven't seen results in what I've been doing for a long time. But now that it's, it's almost like the tipping point's happened and I'm seeing a lot of results in what I've what I set up a year or 18 months ago or two years ago. Um, so for me, building healthy life patterns has probably been one of the most important saviors in my life, if if I should say. Um, so I asked you to put three tips together for building some healthy life patterns that relate to what you do. Mm. What are they? Uh, first one's routine. Um, for me, it sets up my day. Um, so I hear a lot of people say that they don't have time, you know, and they'll say, oh, yeah, but I've got to get the kids ready for school and I've got to get this. Get up earlier. You know, for, for most people, they're like, oh, if I get up at 6 o'clock, like half my day's done by then, and, you know, and that's just how I am because the, why, the reason I get up at 4 o'clock every day is so I've got an hour and a half before with no interruptions, the kids are asleep, my wife's asleep, that's my time. And if I don't get that, mate... I am a miserable bastard, you know, <laughs> so I need that hour and a half to have me coffee, to set up my day, read the Bible. They, they, sometimes I just do whatever I want to do, but that's that gives me routine. It sets up my day. I organise my day. So then when everyone and it's chaotic in the morning, getting the kids ready for school, whatever that looks like for you, then you're already prepared. It's preparation. Mm. But it's really important to have a routine because a lot of people that don't, they're just – they're up, down, they're all over the place. They're not organised. They, they don't know. So I think it's really important to have routine. And if you're bucking at 4 o'clock in the morning, um, <laughs> honestly, uh, I know a lot of people are going, oh, yeah, that's fine for you, Dane. You're a, you're a machine. You're a disciplined person. You're <laughs> but he wasn't always. Mm. And so the reason he does that is because he's actually made a choice to go, well, I'm going to go to bed earlier. I, I'm actually not going to stay up till 10 o'clock at night well, that's all right. I'm a night owl. We'll change that if you really want a healthy routine. So routine, starting early in the morning before anyone. And if that doesn't work for you, knock the kids out for an extra couple of hours somehow so you can sleep in a bit more. But, yeah, definitely I, I endorse the routine of waking up early and getting your own space, however that looks. It comes back to how much you want it though, yeah, mate. You that's know, true. a lot of people will say, Oh, I can't get up at four o'clock. And I'm like, We don't want it enough. No. If that's the only time you're gonna get to help you, yeah. then if you don't want to get up, then you don't want it. Yeah, that, that and we were talking about this off air. Um it's it's you'll only change when the desire to change becomes greater than the desire to stay the same. Mm. And if you really want that, you will really do it. Mm. And um yeah, and you've got no one to blame if you don't. You know, and then again, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll move on. So routine. Routine. Take time for yourself. Um, I did say this falls into, you know, um, you know the, the routine as well. But for some, it mightn't be in the morning, um, you know, but take time for yourself. Have that time. And it's okay. Like we do it. I need it, you know. And, and I'll say to my wife, she'll say, oh, I never get time to myself. Go and have it, you know. Like it's sometimes we fall into them habits where it's like we're used to the same mundane processes every day that we just run out of time or we don't prioritise it. Prioritise it, mm. you know. So get it to a point where actually you understand that reason you need time to yourself. Mm. You know, turn your phone off, you know, have that time 
where you can go and do something. It might be half an hour. It could be 10 minutes. Mm. Sometimes I need a reset where I need to just go into another room and get my thoughts, gather them because I just need to block out everything in the real world that's going on and then I'm good to go again. Yeah, I think it's really important yeah. to take time for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great number tip. Two number tip. Yep. Yeah. Number three. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise, mate. Yeah. Um, and again, it's huge for me um, and, you know, not just to feel and look good. It's – it's in my head, you know, mentally for me, sometimes I might walk out of sessions and go like this morning, I trained this morning, I had a good session, but there was no, I didn't write a, a session plan. I just know the, to get up, to go, to actually train, to sweat, enjoy my time, get out. I'm buzzing, you know, yeah. like it sets, talk about setting your day up. I've spent the hour and a half by myself. I've done all what I needs to do. Everyone's still asleep when I left at 5.30 and I'm home at 6.30 Two of the three boys are still asleep, so I'm I'm doing things for myself, but it's going to help everyone else around me. Yeah, you you're gonna, yeah, you're going to be better for them. Yeah, at the end. Of the day. And and the other one with that is, mate, don't put off things that you can do now. Yeah. You know, and the gym's the massive one for a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people are like, I never have enough time. Like, bullshit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you just again, it's prioritizing. Do you really want to do it or not? You'll find time. Mm. But people put it off and then they get to three o'clock and then it's like, oh, I can't be doing it now. I yeah. can't train even in the afternoon and you don't do it. And then six weeks comes past and then you start hating yourself because you feel like you've put on weight or whatever. But, um, yeah, do things first because I know myself when I go to work and I've spent that time, I've trained, I'm like, I feel free. Yeah. You know, like I don't feel like I've got things in my head that I'm like, I've got to finish this so I can go home and train and do that. So... It's just – it's proven, like yeah. mentally, you know, exercise, go for a oh, walk. Yeah. You don't have to go to the gym, just sweat. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you don't have to sweat. You might go for a walk and not not one bead come down your face. But yeah. just getting out, go to the beach, go for a walk, swim, whatever. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It, like for anyone who hasn't done any of this stuff, we're, we're talking about starting small. Mm. You know, we're, we're actually talking about the 1% as like – even just get out of bed 10 minutes before everyone else and spend that 10 minutes by yourself in your own clarity. Mm. Find some time for yourself during the day where you can actually health, have a healthy habit of just solitude, just even if it's just five minutes. And exercise starts with 10 minutes. Mm. You know, Dane trains for an hour. I I do every every day train for anywhere between half an hour for a half an hour hit session up to an hour and a half for whatever I'm doing. Um, and I, I do the same thing. I go – and do the recovery at, at our friend's P3, at local P3. And uh, I absolutely love it. That's a sauna, cold pool, plunge every day. But that's been built over, like I said before, over a long period of time. Mm. But it started with five minutes here, ten minutes there, add one percenters. Mm. And believe us, you will feel fucking awesome mm. after just starting. Mm. Just start, hey. And, that, and that's – you said it, mate, it builds habits and, yep. you know, that's the opportunity to start doing these things where it's not I have to do it, I, I need to do it. Yeah. You know, having that because it is important to me. Yeah. Because it's just as important as brushing your teeth as a morning because you don't want people talking to you with a, a bad breath. If yeah. that's important to you, you do it every day. Yeah. You want clean, healthy teeth. So go to the gym or do what you need to do for you. Mm. Um, I, I read something um, in the Atomic – Habits. Um, yeah, we were talking about this off off hair before we yeah. started too. And James we, Clear. We, we talk about um, instant gratification and delayed gratification and he talks a couple examples in there and one really like the analogy I, I love as well but it's, it's, you know, it's not an analogy, it's actually how it is. But bamboo, okay, mm. it takes five years before you even notice any growth in bamboo. Yeah. And in that five years it's establishing all its – heavy root systems, undergrounds. So you don't see any of this, yeah. okay? But then after five years, within six weeks, it can get to 90 feet. Wow. So yeah. So you think of about that. When you're working away and you're, you're not seeing any results from the gym after six weeks or two months or six months for some people, um, you know, it's the long haul. It's actually changing – your, your daily habits into good ones, yeah. making them part of your lifestyle, mm -hmm. and then that's just who you are, and then you see the fruit down the track. Yeah, everyone wants to get on a, a now diet or mm. an now thing that can do transform them within a 
you know, a couple of weeks rather than go, well, I'm on a plan for two years, but actually for the rest of my life mm. and this is what's going to set it up. So it's the same sort of theory, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and another thing I um, I wanted to share too from uh, reading that this morning as well, going over a, a few dot points of what I write down is um, – a lot of us focus on the goal. So mm. I think goal setting is good. You yes. Know, you, you've got to have goals. I, I believe in it. Um, but when you focus on the goal and not the process, yeah. um, that's when a lot of people get unstuck. And he says in there, you know, for an example, that, you know, if a football coach um, had a goal to win the premiership, but he didn't focus on the goal, but he just more so focused on what they did at training every day and the process to get there. Do you think he still has a chance of winning the comp? And the answer is yes, yeah. of course he does. And I think it's really important because we can always look at where we want to be, but we're not happy to put in the time and focus on the steps to get there. Yeah. And that's why people, you know, fail on six week diets because, you know, they try a certain way, they they feel like it's doing something all they realise that they just dropped sodium out of their diet and they're just not retaining water. So yeah. they're, they're weighing lighter and then after that they go back to the way they were and it's like, what, well, it didn't change me. Yeah. That's why, you know. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's really important that we, you know, respect the process yeah. and understand that it takes time. You yeah. Know, these, the, anything good in life, it's not instant, right. you know. So no, no. And that's what we're talking about with building healthy life patterns and, um, I think what Dane has also highlighted is three very important things for your mental health and they don't sound like it but they are. Mm. They, they are the physical exercise is so important for your mental health. Uh, routine is so important for your mental health and and um, your own space is so important for your mental health. And so um, the one of the things that James Clear talks about, yeah, and I love that thing about goals because we can get stuck on a goal of, yeah, we win the premiership, but next year they're, they're the wooden spooners because mm. they, didn't, they didn't focus on the process. And so build the process, use the goal for sure, mm. but surpass the goal, go past it and build a healthy life pattern. Yeah. Um, and he talks about, and which is really important for all these as well, is what Dane's talking about, is the habit loop, which is trigger, routine and reward. Mm. And so uh, whatever one of those – uh, or hopefully you adopt all three of those tips, um, find a trigger for them. They're like what's the trigger that's going to get you out of bed that bit earlier in the morning to have your own space? What's a trigger for you to exercise? Mine is putting my gear on. As soon as I've got my workout gear on, I'm, there's nothing that's going to stop me from doing my workout. Mm. And my reward is sitting in the 39-degree pool after the ice bath. <laughs> so, yeah, find some sort of reward that's healthy, not an unhealthy one like scrolling Instagram or something like that. Um Mate, the ch we, every week now we're actually, with our guests, we're talking about challenge. We're, we actually put out a couple of challenges. Um, Larissa's was to walk on the beach without your phone and then reward yourself with a, a coffee. Mm. Um, so leave your phone, don't touch your phone, go for a walk on the beach. Uh, the last Elliot's was uh, to not take your phone to bed, you know, leave your phone away from your bedroom completely and then don't even look at it in the morning and you know, reward yourself with a much healthier life. So I asked you last night, bring some challenges. So what are they, mate? Um, first one's um, to start a gratitude um, journal. So yeah. even if it's sp spend the week, I, I I love writing things down. I, I f find the power in actually putting pen to paper um, and it's so good to be able to have your thoughts and put them down. Sometimes they don't make sense. When you, you know, you look at them, and I went and seen Jordan Peterson a couple of months ago. Uh, that, was, with, that would have been amazing. Yeah, it was so good. And and he he's bringing out an app, um, like a, and it's called SA, I think, and um, a journaling app, pretty much. But he was talking to it about how important it is to write things down, and sometimes they don't make sense, but. The whole idea of a journal is to write everything you're thinking and then to actually go back and take the good out of it, you know, and then that's your opportunity to go, well, that wasn't a good thought but I put it down. But then you start making, you know, your life, you start seeing the gold in it but you've put it down, you've seen it, you've done it, you've been there, you've had the thought, you've put it down and the way he was putting it on the night, like – he had everyone just waiting on every breath that he was, you know, he was talking and um, it's so important and sometimes if I found that every time I do it, it's I get a lot. And, again, I go on and off with it um, but if we prioritise it and actually do it, I think there's – for a lot of people who need something, I think it's a great way to um, start writing things down, you know, get your thoughts on the, and what are you grateful for, you yeah. know. Um, 
and we spoke about this too off air about actually finding with habit sometimes you can um, be in the same atmosphere, uh, the same surroundings and try and replace something where it's if it's watching Netflix um, instead of watching Netflix or read a book, you know, the chances of me sticking to that habit are a lot slimmer because the remote control's very close. I could literally drop the book and put on my show. Yeah. So with this challenge, I challenge people to actually go to somewhere else, create a new habit where it's like, well, instead of journaling at home, I'm going to take that time at a cafe. Yeah. So leave your phone in the car, reward yourself with the coffee and actually take that time. And you, and you tick a few boxes there. Mm. There's solitude there. There's time for yourself. Yeah. And there's actually time to actually get something out of that session as well. Yeah. So journaling, uh, gratitude journaling and journaling. Mm. Um, anything else? Because we did, we did give you room for two. Yeah, we did. Um, just random acts of kindness. Oh, brilliant. You know, I think um, helping people is the best thing we can do because there's a feeling we get out of it, you know. Um and whether it's shouting a coffee, um, and sometimes you can do things without them knowing. You know, a lot of people do things. You see it all over social media. They do it, and they want yeah. someone to record you Look doing it. Look what I just did. Yeah, yeah, and it's not about that. Um, you know, you, you'll see something at the shops, an old lady pushing the trolley, and you know she's going to struggle getting that in a car. Go and help her. Yeah. Um, little things. You know, it might be send a nice message to your friend you hadn't spoke to in a while. Um, just, just think, be intentional about it, um, because that one message, that one random act of kindness, you know, more than likely will make that person's day. Yeah, random act of kindness. You know, we talk about it as a random act of kindness and I like to say it like this, shine your light before men, mm. you know, and expose the love that's actually in your heart because if you don't, it just runs out. Like it's, no one's going to get it. You, you're selfish by keeping it. Mm. So a random act of kindness is just shine that light, shine that light that's deep within you. Mm. Really good. So you have two. So you can pick up one of those as the challenge for this week and each week we are dropping another challenge to help build healthy life patterns. So you can pick up one of those but I suggest you pick up both of them because they're nice and easy. Um, mate, we've come to the end of this episode and I, th I was thinking at the beginning we'll probably get this out in an hour. That would be great. Um, not that it would be great to have a shorter time with you but, you know, didn't want to take too much more of your time, but it's been an hour and a half. Mm. I feel like we've only just tickled the surface, but yeah. a lot of it's been about the men of gold and what you're doing now and the space you've come from. And we did get a little bit political with some stuff and I know I'm going to get um, my, my my head chewed off <laughs> about that, but that's okay. Uh, we just want to get truth out here and that's my truth and it's, uh, it's important for people to understand. I know that's yours as well. We both look the same way there. Um, coming to the end of this episode – Thank you so much for those tips. They're phenomenal. And the challenge, again, gratitude journaling, random after kindness. I'm going to just leave it over to you to uh, anything that you want to say to anyone about what you're doing or about what they need or someone who's seen the men of gold but, you know, they're feeling a bit, you know, like, should I go? or Anything at all, any advice that you want to add now? Yeah, mate, and when you said about challenges, I – I was probably should have been challenging people to come to our, our <laughs> amount of gold nights. But um, it's it's probably that. Like I always think and sometimes I had to check myself um, here a few months ago where I started knowing of people close to me that need this and it's like inside I'm like, why aren't they showing up? Like and the key for me, mate, and to many out there that are listening or want to come and they've never come, just show up, you yeah. know, like – for me, that's the, the most courageous thing you can do is just actually be present, come, make that decision. You, we don't ask you to talk. We don't. If you don't want to, you don't have to. No one's forcing you to do anything. But I think making that effort, it's like, you know, the power that can follow that, that one decision you make. And I just really encourage men to just come along, you know, come. And if it's not for you, that's okay as well. But come and check it out for yourself because there might be something that, helps you or there might be something you offer to someone else and that's the other part of it that will help someone so we we tend to think of this as a real selfish thing where it's all about us so i need to go because i need this and that but sometimes what you actually can offer to someone else is really powerful so really encourage people to come and people that are close to me i'm talking to you as well um, <laughs> you know who you are yeah. too <laughs> um come down like it's not this thing like oh westo's got this men of gold going on and you know like it's all good and praise it and da da but actually you don't have to have trouble in your life to come along oh, come oh. along and, and see what it's about and actually you might get something or something might be revealed to you in them nights where yeah. it's like wow, I've never thought of it like that. Or you might – something might, 
you know, tick in them that actually, you know, opens up some part of your heart and your mind that you've like, I've never thought that until now. Mm. And it might change your perspective on a lot of things. So just really encourage you to come down. Um, our first night back, uh, we'll be back on the 30th of January um, down at Tweed at 6 o'clock Queensland, 7 o'clock New South Wales. 56 Kalula Drive. Yep, we'll Tweed have Heads. We'll have that in the show notes. Yep. So come down um, and we've got some good plans this year uh, for different things and try to change it up a bit and, um, yeah, just looking forward to it, mate, and appreciate the time today. No worries. Mate, thank you so much for being here and you're one of your biggest supporters in in this and um, I know I'm I'm not looking from the sidelines because I'm doing my own thing but whatever else I can do to help support getting the Men of Gold message out there um, because I believe in it so much I will definitely do. And watch this space in the future, guys. Uh, there's going to be plenty more to come. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, mate. That was awesome, buddy. That was amazing. Yeah, it's good. Thanks, mate. Yeah, that time went like that, didn't it? <laughs> wow. What an episode. Thanks again to Dane Weston from the Men of Gold for all you are doing in the community and the reach that you are actually reaching out for and what it means to empower vulnerability. Fantastic, mate. You are doing the work. So I really am proud of what you are and what you are doing, what you stand for. Fantastic. We just want to thank Studio 6 for this episode. Once again, providing a great uh, place for us to release this podcast from. Studio 6 Burley on Instagram. Get a hold of them. And we really need your support to be able to continue to get great guests into the studio. So please, rate, review, send us a, a thumbs up emoji or whatever you need to do just to get us uh, some more support around this podcast. Have a great week and be safe, everyone.